this time to begin our Sunday morning Bible study together. We'd like to welcome each of you present if you're visiting with us. You're an honored guest, and we're so thankful that you're able to be with us. As we begin our quarter, we will begin a study of the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, that will be our focus as we uh, get some feedback. Uh, go through this quarter. I was hoping that, and it did turn out, I had some slides for us this morning to use, and um, I wasn't sure if that was going to work or not. Uh, I don't have a lot of faith in technology. I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot of y'all's livelihood is technology, but um, I've had some lecture experience in the past that uh, didn't support technology very well. 30 years ago this past April, I did a presentation for 43 dentists on a Saturday morning at Golden Corral in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. I had a four-hour lecture with four carousel trays of slides. Now, go figure that one out. That was a while back, and that was some of the modern technology at the time. I was so proud of myself, I had advanced from transparencies. So we're moving along quite well. I got ready to do the presentation. I got into it for 15 minutes, and my projector went haywire, wouldn't work, wouldn't accept the carousel trays. I had four trays full of some of the best information you've ever wanted to hear about toothpaste for four <laughs> hours. I know you don't even realize you can have that much information in a tube that you use, but you can. And I get so excited talking about it. Well, that kind of just took the wind right out of my sails. So I said, well, you have to be flexible. I said, we go from four trays to no trays, we go from four hours to 45 minutes. That was the happiest dentist I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Bring us back up to the last time I taught here. Again, technology challenge. I failed to realize, I hate to admit this, but I failed to realize that These sessions are recorded and live so other people can watch them. And I've watched some of them. If you ever weigh and want to, I'd encourage you to do so. They're, the technology people do a great job. I asked someone to lead prayer because I was running behind. I asked someone to lead prayer. As they were leading prayer, I decided to go ahead and finish setting up my notes and looking in my Bible and everything. Well, I was reminded when I got home and was showed on the video, it showed me doing all this preparation and looking around and this and that as everybody was in prayer with their head bowed, and I didn't realize that I'd been caught. So trust me, any time we have a prayer in this class this quarter, I will not do one single thing. <laughs> but anyway, so that kind of takes us up to where we are. And the only other thing is, is with Ka I wish Kathy Seaton was here. She would appreciate this. I have the wireless mic on. I don't have a belt. I use the suspenders. You go figure out why. And um, I don't have anything to keep this monitor on very well. So sure as well, I'm going to be in this presentation and it's going to fall off. So anyway, we'll just we'll go with the flow as we have the need to. But. With that, I said, let's have a word of prayer as we set our minds. Almighty, gracious, heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day, for the time that we have to come together to study your word and to be able to open it to where we can look at the letter to the church at Corinth and we could look at the challenges that that congregation faced during their time. 
and solutions that Paul recommended for them to follow to help better the church there. We pray, Father, that we can look inwardly at our congregation, at the congregations that we affiliate with, support, that we can be so attentive, Father, that we don't experience the same challenges and difficulties that the church at Corinth did. Help us to look at this book as a positive learning experience that we can take away actions, attitudes, that our focus could be that we can be the best and the most strongest congregation for thee as well as help others to be as well. Father, at this time we pray that you guide us in our thoughts. In Christ's name, amen. As a background before we get started, I think it'd be nice for us to take a look at uh, some of the uh, facts as it relates to 1 Corinthians. The book was written by the Apostle Paul, as we well know, and this, he was in Ephesus at the time of the writing, the time that he received this letter, and the time he wrote it, he was in Ephesus uh, when he felt the need to respond to notifications from the congregation of some of the challenges that they were facing. It's written in A.D. 55, about four years after the church was established by Paul in Corinth. So Paul had left, and the congregation was doing well, and there was a blend between the Jews and the Greeks, and everything was going well fine, except all of a sudden some problems, some issues crept into the congregation that was causing a disturbance, and Paul was made aware of those matters. He wrote it to the members, as we said, of the Corinthian church. He wrote it to, uh, he established the church back around A.D. 51, early 52, this time he was, when he established the church, he was in, uh, on his second missionary journey. And uh, now he's, when he receives notification of problems and challenges and issues, he is on his third uh, missionary journey at the time. He stayed approximately 18 months or a little bit longer, some commentaries say, uh, with those in Corinth in helping to establish the church and helping to convert and win souls and being able to set up a congregation there. That was his mission. That's why he wanted to go there. The interesting part about it is when Paul, as a preacher, went to Corinth, There was no big fanfare of his arrival. Nobody knew anything about him. He just showed up. And he was there for the purpose of conversion, of teaching the word, of winning souls. But no major announcement, no hoopla, no fanfare. The reason I say that is in every chapter that we have, in the book of 1 Corinthians, there is a problem discussed and a solution given. And the problem that <clears throat> exists in the first chapter was what? Anybody care to share? What was the main problem? Division. Division. And that's exactly right. There was major division that had taken place among the members. And Paul was addressing this. And part of that, we'll get into that in a little while, part of it was is that the division that we talk about in chapter 1 is that caused by personalities and individuals. The members had disregarded what had been presented to them, that they had been baptized to follow and to... the word of God and started following individual personalities, favorite people, whoever. Does that happen today? 
It certainly does. And we're not going to name among congregations within the Church of Christ. We're not going to name names of congregations that have split, that have fallen apart, that don't even exist any longer as a result of people following personalities and egos and, and, and that. But it happens. We know it happens. And we need to be extremely cautious as we go about our worship and our assemblies and as we go about our work as the collective body of members here at North Lexington to make certain that we stay firm and solid to what we are here for, who we're following, which is God and the Word of God and not individuals. But we'll deal with that a little bit more in depth as we move along. Galileo was uh, mentioned of Galileo. <clears throat> uh, he was the governor of Achaia between June 51 and May of 52. The reason I put that in there is that some of the commentaries indicated that this can give us a really good read of when the actual timing was for Paul's uh, writing or the establishment of the church here in Corinth by Paul. Um, at the conclusion prior to his departure, there, got, there happened to be an uproar. A charge, they charged uh, Paul uh, of false accusations, false charges. He went before the uh, governor. Uh, they wanted him uh, found guilty of these charges, but uh, the pro council or the governor said that it really was just a dispute among the law within the Jewish body, and it wasn't a criminal nature, so he let it go. But as a result of that, Paul left Corinth and, and uh, <clears throat> went on from, from there. I think, it's in, <clears throat> I think it's important as we think about the congregation of a body of Christ that's been established for about four years and they have all great and good intentions of making certain that they follow the word of God, follow what they have been taught but yet they set them they have among themselves they are within a city that is so majorly corrupt and they're having to deal with that and I think as we, before we get into it, it'd be ideal for us to uh, look at some of the facts pertaining to Corinth. Uh, it's located between two seaport cities about 10 miles apart, one on the west coast, one on the east coast. It is extremely uh, a very highly commercial area, and most of the commerce commercially came from those seaports, so it was a very well done and a wealthy city. Uh, it was the capital of Achaia. Uh, in the city itself were schools on philosophy and rhetoric. Uh, they were litigious, litigious uh, city. They went to court and sued after each other. And it was a very immoral city. Uh, matter of fact, the temple of, of Venus uh, was there uh, also, just south of the city, just right on the area of the uh, city limits, you might say, was a, a mountain range about 1,800 feet high. And uh, this played to the disadvantage of the church and to the advantage of those for shrines and idols and uh, worship that was not uh, what God had taught because they built a lot of idols and a lot of shrines in this particular area. So it was not uh, a, a setup of a city that was conducive to help continue to support a young congregation without being a um, bothering them or trying to drag them down in whatever way they wanted to do so. Oops, I got to go back. My bad on that one. Uh, why it was written, uh, as we know, Paul 
had received notification from um, those in the house of Chloe that there were problems that existed in the church. And as we move through the book of 1 Corinthians, we're going to look at individual problems. But I don't want us to dwell on it being a negative, but to realize that those same problems could be in existence and is in existence today in the church if we're not careful. And then how do we deal with that? And how do we build from that? I thought it was really interesting in looking at one concept. Here's the part that I think is really interesting. That sermon was delivered on August the 10th, 1947, by a very well-known brother in the brotherhood. So it's just like, it can happen then, it can happen now. Our attitude is how do we want to deal with it? How do we want to handle it? How do we want to be aware of the challenges that we have and go with it? Now, if someone would be kind enough as we enter into chapter 1, if you would be willing to read verses 1 through 3, I'd greatly appreciate it. Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and of, our, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it tells us that the gospel calls us all to become Christians. And Jesus also called on Paul to be an apostle. Why was that? Why did Jesus call on Paul to become and be a, an apostle? Paul was bicultural or multicultural. Mm -hmm. Back to right. Then again, God knew Paul's heart, whereas the rest of us didn't. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and what Sandy says is exactly right, and it helped him to better have the potential to deliver the gospel to these individuals and to preach 
and convert uh, individuals. Now, yes, John. Very true. Thank you, John. Exactly. So what we can say is, is that Paul was called out of the world to be sent to the world. And that kind of goes with what John is. He was called out of the world of sin and converted. And with the power and the dedication, as what John said, he was put back in the world, you might say, under the, under the law, to be uh, helping converting. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says that he was an ambassador, an ambassador representing Christ and his teaching to a lost and dying world. Are there, ambassadors, are there ambassadors today in the body of Christ? All of us should be. Yes. yes. Exactly. Paul said we are ambassadors. Yeah, we are ambassadors. Matter of fact, he did say that in uh, Second, um, I think it said Matthew twenty-eight eighteen that we uh, are ambassadors. We don't have the power that Paul had with miraculous gifts, but we are ambassadors to teach and to represent Christ in the world. We're definitely that. A lot of part of verse 1, we know Paul wrote it, and a lot of part of verse 1, and I've been working on this word for a long time since I started this. Randy gave me six months to try to get it right. Sosthenes, is that close enough? How do you say that? Sosthenes? We get over here where y'all can know what I'm talking about. All right, come on, pop him up. Okay. Sosthenes? How do you say it? Sosthenes. Sosthenes. Now, guys, you got to remember I'm from Mississippi, so I have a little bit more southern accent. Okay, Sosthenes. Okay. Anyway, we'll work through this. There's a story right there. I was in a Panama, Peru trip doing mission work. And I was talking, trying to talk Spanish. I learned six words of Spanish. And I was so proud of myself. And I was talking to this gentleman, trying to tell him what to do. And he just acted like he didn't know anything. And so he got ready to leave, and I told him thank you in Spanish. I was so proud of myself. And he said, you're welcome. He could speak English about as good as I could. But uh, not with a southern accent living in Kentucky. Come on, that's, that's, that's a different thing here. All right. So he refers to Sosthenes as his brother, as our brother. Why? Why does he reference that? And who is this individual? Do we know? Do we know specifically who this individual is? You can look at many, many, many different references, and it's nothing specific. It's thought to be that the Sosthenes that is referenced here is, was part of the uh, Jewish uh, synagogue in Corinth. And what they say is, is if this individual referenced in verse 1 is the same one, that is in Acts 18:7, uh, there was conversion that did take place. But regardless, Sosthenes is with Paul as he's writing this letter. And so I think it's very important to realize that. Any comments or any questions pertaining to it? <clears throat> Before we get off of the first verse, Paul is... Uh, 
Paul still is trying to provide guidance. He's still trying to teach. And he is really trying his best to continue to win souls and help correct individuals here. So he writes, he's writing in verse 2 to the church of God at Corinth. There's three different individuals or three different groups that he's writing to here. First, he's writing to the congregation of Corinth that had been called out of the world. Also, he else he's writing to who? Who else is he writing to? Writing to the congregation. We know that it says here, verse 2. But who else is he writing to? I'm sorry? Yeah, they, they, they would, but they, he addresses it from a broad perspective as a congregation, as an individual perspective as a Christian of that congregation. And the point it's telling here is that he referenced, and Ken has already said, that we are saints. We are ambassadors because we're part of the congregation. So Connie's right. They're, they're inseparable to some degree. He addresses it wholly as a congregation. He gets more specific to individuals. And then he writes to others that may uh, hear uh, uh, on, the, on, on what's being taking place in regard. Saint. What is the... What are the criteria? What's the expectations of saints? What's the expectation of us? We say we're saints. Are we saints today? Yes. Okay. What's some of our, what's some of the characteristics or criteria of being a saint? What's some of the roles and duties of being a saint? Besides, we are an ambassador of the body of Christ. Is there specific evidence in the Bible that tells us criteria that we should be following if we call ourselves a saint? I'm sorry? We obey all the teachings of Christ. Correct. We obey all the teachings of Christ. Exactly. And we teach mm -hmm. the teachings of Christ. Mm hmm That's true. Very true. Very true. Thank you, Sandy. These are the three that we talked about uh, that the letter was written to. Now, sanctification is mentioned in, in verse 2. Those that are sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Set apart. Exactly right. Set apart. Different uh, from the world. When we obey the truth, we are, we are sanctified uh, as, as part of that responsibility. Does that mean that by being set apart that we, it's impossible for us to sin anymore? No, it does not. It does not uh, in, the, in whatever ways there. We can fall away. 
Brother uh, Dehoff said some of God's children who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb will later turn and be lost in hell at the last great day. Things can change, but when we are baptized, we are apart. We are set apart from that of the world. And the world should be able to see that differentiation as well. As Christians, we are saints. First of all, someone turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Someone read that, please. Okay, so the criteria and expectation is that we're separated, that we set ourselves apart. We're also to be active. Someone turn to, for sake of time, turn to Romans 13 and 11. There's another reference there, but for time's sake, someone read Romans 13, 11. Our, our, we need to go about doing the, our business of conversion and, and uh, representing Christ in everything that we do on a daily basis. We need to make it part of our daily routine, part of our actions. Someone turn to Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Someone read it, please. So we would be influential. They should be able to see good works through us and our actions by those that are looking and following and observing us. Also, we would be noble. Acts 17, 11, and 12. Someone read that one, please. Uh, searching the scriptures become better servants and being able to help better teach and convert let's look at 2 Peter 1 6 2 Peter 1 6 we're to be temperate Also turn to 1 Corinthians 9:25. Thank you for the reading. 1 Corinthians 9 and 25. And every 
one who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Okay, so we're not doing it for the show of it. We're doing it in the right attitude, and that is for eternal life. Also, <coughs> we're spiritual. Galatians 6 and 1. Someone read that one, please. Galatians 6 and 1. Thank you. So it's our responsibility to help coach and guide and bring those back that may be uh, off uh, on the wrong path, you might say. So here are other characteristics of what a saint's responsibilities and actions should be. So yes, we are a saint. We're an ambassador daily for Christ. But we need to make sure in order to maximize that role that we follow these different criteria here. Verse 3, this is the standard salutation of Paul in a number of his books. Uh, a matter of fact, all of his books, you might say. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace being that of unmerited favor. Peace is his serenity, our serenity and tranquility. And the sources of all these blessings come from Christ. Uh, we have all of these blessings. Uh, he is, in 1 Peter 5 and 10, known as the God of all grace. He provides us all of this. In Nehemiah 9, 17 and 31, he's a God gracious and merciful now, pertaining to peace, in Romans 15 and 33, he's a God of peace. So all of what we have and all these sources of blessings, whether it be grace or peace, comes from God himself. One of the authors said that if there's a congregation that should understand grace and peace, it should be Corinth. And God had brought them up out of the depths of despair and depravity and bless them with all the spiritual blessings that he did. Any comments on the first three basic uh, opening uh, for this chapter here? Any, anyone? Let's read verses four through nine. Verse four through nine. Someone read that if you'd be kind enough, please. A lot of times Paul would open his letters with prayer, which he's doing so here as well. And in this prayer of thanksgiving, uh, he's thankful to God for two primary things. He's thankful to God for the grace that had been bestowed upon the Corinthians through Christ. And he's thankful to God in this prayer that the Corinthians had no deficiency as it regarded spiritual gifts. Now, one of the problems they do encounter later is, is that of the gifts that they do have. And we'll have a much more in-depth study of that. I, I think it's chapter 12, somewhere in that range. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that much more in detail at that time. 
Paul looks at the Corinthian church as uh, it was in Christ. He looked at it as if it was what it used to be, what it had been. He was not a pessimist. He realized that things could happen. He didn't beat him to death over what he's going to talk to him about. He was always thankful for the Corinthian church. He could be able to see that there's opportunity to refocus, that there's a chance that he has to help provide them guidance in the, in the areas that he feel like they need to in order to be back, come back to where they had been. But he was an optimist. He expects, and we should be as Paul was, an optimist today. Even in time of hardship, time of problem, there is always optimism that we, through Christ, can find a solution. And Paul offers to the congregation here, during their times of the different problems that we'll be looking at, uh, spiritual solutions that was an answer for them and it can be an answer for us today any comments before we wrap up our time's running out pretty close here anybody have anything to say I think any time you're going to give somebody uh, bad not bad news but you want to talk to them about mm -hmm. what they're not doing correctly right you start off by saying what they're, you know, the, something good about. Right. And I think this is, the, this part is really uh, telling them, you know, the, remember the things that you have uh, and, and to uh, give them a better feeling about themselves before he goes into saying, but, but here's some things that are, that mm -hmm. you need to work on. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Other comments, anyone? Hey, but somebody, do I have something? <laughs> that is exactly right. That is, that is uh, very true. Thanks for sharing that. We'll conclude at this time. I've got about another minute. You can visit, introduce yourself to our visitors, and we'll start our service at 1030. Thanks so much.